Glad you are here. Uh, Mr. Robbie was my assistant for most of the day. I don't see Kathy. So hopefully everyone is good with uh, uh, the portions of, the, uh, of the, the notes that you have. If not, uh, I'm, I'm certain we can get you tonight's note. Make, sh make sure everyone has tonight's notes that we're going to walk through. And then we can, we can work on making sure you have uh, all the notes if you missed any weeks, okay? Uh, FYI, starting the second night, we started recording these, so two of them should be online, and, and then this one will be online, and, and the subsequent ones, so that you can, you can catch up. I know you guys are busy folks, and so uh, catching up. Uh, we've been walking through in this class, Spiritual Disciplines. Um, this class is the third in a series that began with the gospel, just a deep dive into the heart of the gospel. What is the gospel? What are the magnificent pictures and themes that the scripture unfolds with the gospel? Then it was followed up with a, a walk through your identity in Christ, okay? The promises that are yours in Christ. Um, and now the third one is on spiritual disciplines. That order is very intentional. You must understand. This is the way that the Bible unfolds, okay? Your power in walking out the Christian life is based on you understanding the gospel and then understanding your identity, okay? The spiritual disciplines and the rolling up your sleeves and doing the daily walk is very important, but it will be nothing but works righteousness if it is not based on a foundation of the gospel and your identity in Christ, okay? So that order is important. I continue to remind you of it. Um, all right, we've been spending, we are on week four, and we've been walking through the importance of Scripture that God meets us in Scripture. Um, and we, we all know, uh, right, if you've heard one pastor say it, uh, it's been drilled into you, read your Bible, okay? But reading your Bible is not always easy. It's complex. It's filled with, uh, at times, confusion because there's a lot that goes into it. So we covered some of that, and I gave you guys a lot of notes. By the way, I, I bring all the... Uh, all the books that I keep referencing, they're over here on a table. So if you weren't here for some of the first times and you want resources, one of my major jobs and one of the jobs of the pastoral team is to resource you, okay? Is to equip you. I, I take that very seriously, to be able to point you to important and helpful resources. So uh, after, after some general resources, and I pointed some things here and there and, and whatnot, then we spent a couple, uh, a couple sessions walking through major themes and stories of the Bible just to help you. One, it's, it's only a taste of what I could do, but I tried to do some of the major ones that would help you just see the way that the Bible is put together, the way that the Bible is one continuous story. Uh, at the same time, I, I tried to get you excited about the Scripture, show you some things that maybe you haven't seen before, but show you that, that God is the author of the Scripture, right? And so when you see, like when we were in Daniel 6, the incredible sealing of the tomb and with the king's seal, and then early the next morning, the king rose up to see if Daniel was still alive and to piece that together with, my goodness, that's a picture of the women going to the sealed tomb of Christ, and he's alive, right? Just to know that, that hundreds of years prior, God on his throne was weaving all of those things together, right? So trying to get you excited about that. Last time, we began a real practical walk through uh, how to study your Bible on a regular basis, okay? And what I hammered on was that you must approach the Bible through the lens that you need to see God. See God. And, and I unfolded the way that Scripture shows you that we are blind to the spiritual realities, that Satan wants to keep us blind and our culture wants to keep us blind, but the scripture itself continually calls you to see, to see him, 
Okay, so when you read, yes, yes, uh, ask uh, what genre is this and where are we in the story and, and some of those things. And I gave you really practical tools at the end of it to ask every time you're, you're reading your Bible and you're journaling, what is this about? What does this say about man? What does this say about God? And, and how do we see this through the lens of the gospel? But more than anything, that you would approach God's word with the heartbeat of, God, I want to see you. Okay, I would liken that to uh, the, the description of what I'm going to refer to tonight uh, in our spiritual warfare and in, in the battle that is uh, uh, the armor of God that we are to put on, that what I described last time was the belt of truth. Okay, in the, in the soldier's preparation, he is to gird his loins in truth. And, and he used to have a long, flowy robe in ancient warfare, uh, like a dress, and, and you would not be very agile when warfare came. So when a man was ready to take, become active, you would gird your loins, and that is you would reach down, you would tie all that up. Okay, well, uh, in, in uh, the Romans, uh, they had a, a belt, okay? So it's your own preparation, and uh, the, the belt of truth is the word of God. So that you should be reading your Bible on a consistent basis, trying to seek and find God and, and, and pray. And, and he will show you himself. And so we walk through a sample of that. Okay. And now this time, and you guys all moaned. I'm surprised you guys came back because I told you what I was going to talk about this week. <laughs> and that is we're going to talk about scripture memory. But you still came back, so that's where we're going. <laughs> All right, so you can look at, you can look at your, your lesson there. You know, the world was at war and ravaging itself. Uh, the Nazis had overcome Poland and Denmark and France. They were constantly on the move. But the position of the United States was, we're going to stay out of this. We're going to stay out of this. Britain and Soviets were engaged on a two-front war at that time. All of Europe and Northern Asia, all in upheaval. And the United States said, let's stay out of this. Let's stay out of this. And then one sleepy Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941, Fire began to rain from the sky upon our naval base in Pearl Harbor. Okay, four battleships sunk, three cruisers, three destroyers, 188 aircraft, 2,400 Americans dead. And guess what? We were at war. You see, I share that with you because it doesn't matter if you would like to think of our world that we are in, if you would like to think of lives as war, if you would like to come up with much more pleasant ideas of, of the nature of us here on earth until we return, the reality is still you are at war. Whether you want to be or not, you are at war. You are engaged in a spiritual battle that is raging on around you all the time. And it doesn't matter if you can't see it or you can't perceive it. The reality is, is it is there and it is engaging you. Whether you like it or not, you didn't get to choose it, okay? Imagine you're a, a, a child who, who's been uh, born in Ukraine, <laughs> Do you have the option of saying, I don't want to be at war? No, it, you're at war. I don't know what to tell you. You are. And that's the, that's the picture that the Bible paints. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. By the way, this is the way he, he concludes the book of Ephesians because he's, he's summarizing everything that's gone on. And here's where he chooses to land. That you and I are called to put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the armor of God 
so that you will be able to stand firm and resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. And that's why I walked through where we were last week, right? Your daily Bible reading is your own preparation, your own mindset towards uh, God and truth and the, the need for it. It is your constant feeding. But he ends this section in the armor of God with you've been given one offensive piece of weaponry. One, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. When you think about modern day warfare, everything's moved to be really far away. Right? It's done with drones and laser-guided missiles and bombs and radioing in things and just, uh, right, let's, let's just use a remote control. Don't give me that face over there. Why? Why do you want to use as much far away stuff as possible? It saves lives, right? We can blow up junk and metal. And let's blow the enemy up, not ourselves. If you were picking uh, a weapon that God might give you for uh, your, your armor, your one offensive weapon, maybe you would choose, right? He, the, the devil is able to throw fiery arrows and darts at you, right? So ancient warfare, you'd at least have archers. You don't have an arrow, a bow and arrow. That's not what he gave you. You don't even have a javelin to be able to throw at anyone. The only thing you have is a short sword for face-to-face, hand-to-hand combat, right? We want everything to be far away. We want it to be easy and, and detached. That, that ain't the case. Again, you're not picking any of this. You see, there is a battle for our minds. There is a battle for your mind. You walk through the problems. You have a blinding enemy, as we walked through last time, who is a liar, who deceives the whole world. You believe that statement? Think about it. He deceives the whole world. The whole world is deceived. Does not even understand the level of deception twists God's word in Eden and in Jesus' temptation. Don't you think he'll twist God's word with you? Anytime the word of God is not received, immediately snatches it away, declares it foolishness, and he has the ability to blind the minds of unbelievers. There is a battle for your mind. Because as a man thinks, so he is. It's the reason this is the third course and why we walk through the gospel and your identity and your promises and who you are. Because there's a battle for your mind. On top of that, we have a sinful, selfish mind that's fallen with fallen desires. Additionally, whether you like it or not, you are impacted by a cultural worldview. Is there anything with the worldview of the culture that bothers you? <laughs> dare you, uh, dare I ask for you to say a few, a few things? What's wrong with the worldview of the culture? All right, it's selfish. Okay, it, it, it sells you on the idea that if you make yourself an idol, then you will be happy, right? Part of it is based on uh, the way the economy works and, and selling you stuff. Oh, you'll be happy if you wear this shirt. Oh, if your shirt had a little thing on it, oh my goodness, then you'd be happy. You'd be somebody if you had a horse on your shirt. <laughs> or, or 
X, Y, Z, right? It doesn't matter because they're in the business of selling you stuff. So they want to make you believe you'll be happy when you get this. So it's, it's, this, it's completely selfish. That's, that's the whole idea. What else about the worldview of our culture? It's divisive. Okay. Very divided. How? We become very tribal. Okay. Ah, oh, that's good. <clears throat> yeah, the world the world tells you all the time and your flesh tells you all the time to to spend your whole time in comparison. Is isn't that just the pits? It's the worst. I can be so happy with things that are going on in my life. I can see the hand of God. Suddenly I hear something good is going on over there. And I'm like, you know what? I, what happened to me? Why did I get that good thing? It's ridiculous. Okay. Okay, they certainly want you to be lukewarm about the Lord. Don't get all passionate about that. You can believe that if, if you want. Just stay over in your own corner. Well, they, they seem to take even further. You know, a lot of major corporations now don't even want to push that agenda, right? They yeah. want you to hush up, but they want to push other agendas that are being pushed by the world that go directly against the religious people. And don't think for one second, they're always in it for the bottom line. It's all about money to them. Truth is no longer absolute. Yeah, yeah. So, so truth is in an in individual. All right, so you can make up your, your own truth. Truth is in you. Okay, yeah. Because of this... It makes this, this giant move. Because truth is not absolute, we can't declare those things. Therefore, the general consensus is that uh, tolerate it as long as it's not hurting someone. That, that's about as much as we can say. If you're not hurting someone else, uh, then we have to tolerate it. And lately, we've gone past that. Lately, we tolerate even if it does hurt somebody else as long as it's not me. <laughs> It is, it is. It is very quickly perverted, right? You're taking advantage of the weak. You value only somebody that contributes to the powerful. So there's a war on children, there's a war on anybody that's... Let me ask you this. Look, look at the next one. So there's, there's a culture of worldview that... Uh, world view that uh, listen, you, you're susceptible to it, all right? It's, it's all around you. Yeah, no, no, no. Maybe it's a selfish question. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's always been this way, right? It's always been that way. It's always been this way. It gets amped up. It's, it's in your face. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, the, the fourth thing I have under there, when I'm talking about the battle that is for your mind, is a little thing called information overload. Because I want you to think about... There's this, there's this incredible stat that I've been told that in the weekday edition of the New York Times, there is more information in one weekday newspaper of the New York Times than Jonathan Edwards was ever introduced to in his entire life. I don't know how you justify that stat. I can tell you this. In 1976, in the average supermarket had 9,000 items. Okay, 40 years later, instead of 9,000 items, there are 40,000 items in every supermarket. 
think about the number of TV channels that you have access to. Think about the amount of information that is on your phone. That there is more technology in this thing in my pocket than what sent man to the moon. Think about the number of decisions that you have to make in a day. There's a thing now called decision fatigue. There's information anxiety. My point is simply this. Put all these things together, that you have a blinding enemy, that you yourself have a sinful, selfish mind, that you are deeply impacted by the worldview of the culture that is contrary to the Bible, and you live in a day and time when you are processing more information, having more information thrown at you than at any other time in the history of the world, that at minimum clouds your judgment or becomes a constant barrage of being attacked, how much more so do we need to have Scripture in our hearts so that we can battle the enemy that is constantly at war around you. I don't want to be at war. It doesn't matter. You are at war. This is the lay of the land. So let's be challenged by a couple of Scripture passages, the way that Scripture constantly begs you to deeply think about it. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. I underline those, those words there because there is opposition around you all the time. You have the option. This is Psalm 1. By the way, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are the introduction to the entire book of Psalms. One is about the Word of God, and the second one is about the coming King. It's what the entire book of Psalms is about. The Word of God and the coming King. And here, in Psalm 1, the introduction is that you have an option. You can stand in the counsel of the wicked and in the path of sinners and in the seat of scoffers, or you can be one who does not do that, but instead his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in its season. Leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. Look at Proverbs 22. Listen to the charge of Proverbs. By the way, the whole first nine chapters of Proverbs are a declaration that wisdom is crying out in the streets. You got to listen. That, that actually is, remember last week, it was you are responsible to see and to hear. God is speaking. Are you listening? And so here he circles around in Proverbs 22. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise. Apply your mind. You have to apply yourself. This is the roll up your sleeves part, right? Apply your mind. Keep this within you that they may be ready on your lips. How about that? God's word would be ready on your lips. Joshua 1.8 we know this, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. All right? And then you'll have success. I, God gives promises. Colossians 3. Keep seeking the things above, right? You know that. Keep focusing. You can get so easily distracted. Set your mind on the things above. And then finally this one, Romans 12, 1 through 2. Incredible verse, right? We could, we could spend three weeks on this one verse, on all that's going on. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living and holy sacrifice. Remember when we walk through the, the worship content, that, that Old Testament worship, there was a sacrifice in the temple, and then Jesus comes as a sacrifice, and now we're the living sacrifice because God lives in us, okay? 
Present your body as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Okay, you being a living sacrifice, living out your life for him, that is how you worship, that all of life is worship. Now he gives specific instructions. What does that look like? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. And then this is incredible. So that you will prove what the will of God is. Who's going to prove what the will of God is? I mean, God doesn't just like always, Jason, do this. No, that's not how it's supposed to work. How's it supposed to work? My mind is so transformed because I put on my belt of truth and I have my sword of the Spirit that my mind gets transformed in the Spirit of God inside me. I'm actually able to discern what God is doing. You become a participant, not a robot, a participant. It's beautiful. It's magnificent. Okay, why have I said all of that? Because I want you to see that there is a battle for your mind. And Scripture is screaming, it's trying to compel you to take God's Word, meditate on it, hide it in your heart so that you will be ready. That said, turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Matthew 4. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. Matthew 4 is the temptations of Jesus. I talked about this section of Matthew a couple weeks ago. It's magnificent in the the movement that uh, Matthew is describing, that, that Jesus has come as the new Israel. He is the new Moses. He, he, uh, uh, had a similar birth experience as Moses. He went to Egypt, he came back, and then uh, then he immediately is in the wilderness for 40 days, led by the Spirit of God for 40 days, and then he is tempted by Satan. Okay, there's a lot we could say about these temptations that Jesus goes through. There are three temptations And they ultimately end up as uh, categorical temptations. And the first one, Jesus is tempted uh, to turn the stones into bread because he is suffering. And just like Israel in the wilderness was suffering, they didn't have a lot of food. Okay, and they grumbled and complained. Jesus wasn't grumbling and complaining. But Satan comes along and and tempts Jesus and tells him, turn the stones into bread. What is underneath that temptation is this, that you should not suffer for God. Why would you suffer? God doesn't want you to suffer. He would never call you to do anything that was difficult. You shouldn't do that. You should take a shortcut. You're the son of God. Turn those stones into bread. Okay? Jesus replies. Can someone tell me where he replies or how he replies? He quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. Okay? When we went through this a couple uh, times ago, I pointed out all three times when he quotes uh, the scripture, he quotes the same section of scripture because it's parallel to Israel's temptations and he is not sinning like Israel sins or you and I sin. Okay. All right. And then he goes through two more temptations. Uh, One is to take everything into his own hands and... uh, Uh, to plan out his own steps, to come up with his own glorious path. Um, And instead, he's to wait on God's path, trust God. And then the last one is to forget God in the good times. Okay, To forget God in the good times. That was Israel's temptation of entering the land. They were going to enter a land that was filled with homes that they didn't build and vineyards that they didn't uh, plant and wells that they didn't dig. 
Um, and, and in this section of Deuteronomy, Moses says to him, do, do not forget God when you go into the land. And that's what Jesus quotes here. All right. So now that we're familiar with the text again, all right, let's notice a couple things. In that second temptation, what did Satan do? Yeah, he also quoted scripture, didn't he? Satan quoted scripture to Jesus. Why did he do that? Yeah, yeah, because he loves to be a deceiver. He loves to, isn't that what he did in Eden? Right? That, that he would actually know the word of God better than you and love to twist it so that you would use it for your own selfish gain. Now think about that. That's what he did in Eden. Did God, did God say you couldn't even touch that tree? You will not surely die. He's constantly twisting. And here the same thing. Uses a scripture passage completely out of context, trying to twist it all around. Do we live in a day and culture where people might write and sell books about twisting scripture passages for your own gain? We see that. We recognize that in our own culture. Right? That's Okay. So first, we notice that Satan also knows Scripture, and he loves to twist it. Secondly, we notice this all three times, and I know you've heard this a ton of times. All three times, Jesus does what in response to Satan? He quotes Scripture. Have you ever thought, why didn't, D why didn't Jesus just say no Right? Why didn't they go, uh, you know, hey, Satan, uh, or hey, Jesus, turn these stones into bread? No. <laughs> right and then he goes to the next one. Why is it? This is the Son of God. Why does Jesus quote Scripture? He's providing, He's providing our example, yes. Yeah, he's the word of God, but he's still quoted scripture. There must be some power in this. That even the son of God filled with the spirit of God quotes scripture at Satan. He didn't just say, no, get out of here. He didn't. Think about that. Think about that long and hard. If the Son of God, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, when he faced the enemy, he quoted Scripture, what's your plan of attack? Are you trusting in your good looks or like, oh, I'm pretty smart, I'll get out of that? Why? Because the third thing, trials are coming. You know that, right? Trials are coming. You will be attacked. Guaranteed. You have an enemy. There's a culture war view. You're having arrows thrown at you constantly all the time. There's battles within your home. There's battles at your work. You face a spiritual foe and the example that has been given you by the Son of God himself filled with the Holy Spirit of God is that he knew the Word of God and he said it and he knew that that is where victory was found. Not in any other way. So do not be surprised at fiery ordeals which come against you for your testing as if something strange were happening to you. So when you're reading your Bible on a consistent weekly basis, 
I also want you to be reading through the lens of is what are my issues, right? If you're writing out some of the, the issues that are popping up in your life on a regular basis, God wants you to lay this down. God wants you to lay that down. And you, and you deal with it for that time and you, you repent of it. Should that be the end of it? No. You should find a sword for that trial. You should search the scripture with the intention. There is some scripture that I need to memorize to battle this in my life. When I counsel, the primary, word, uh, the primary weapon I have that I can give people is to circle up for us to put our finger on issues and then for me to ask the question, what does the Word of God say about that? Oh, it says something different from what I'm believing. So what are we going to do about it? We're going to memorize God's Word and we're going to begin to apply it so what do you struggle with? Anyone in here struggle with anxiousness? Over finances? Over obstacles at work? Relationships in your family? Wayward family members? How many scripture passages do you have memorized for those things so that you can battle for your soul and your own personal self-care with the Word of God? That you would know God's Word and that you would believe it and that you would use it. That you would use it with your struggle, with your anxiety, and then on top of that, you could say, well, I don't have any of those problems. I'm pretty good. All right? What about for other people? If you're going to be a light in this world, what is our culture struggling with right now? We are more anxious. We lack, we lack peace. We're more suicidal. We're more medicated. We're more confused. We got more stuff. We're more busy. We got all that stuff. When you are witnessing in your, uh, at work, at your supermarket, when you come across people, what issues do they have? Do you offer them, well, it'll be all right. Or do you offer them the Word of God? You see, because if the Word of God is true and active and able to separate and divide a man's soul, then your most powerful weapon is not being sympathetic and saying, it'll be all right, but rather it's to have a Word of God for them as you witness and as you counsel so that we would know God's word and we would believe its power and its authority that if Jesus himself used it, it, it must be worth having. So that said, I've given you a couple uh, scripture memory books or sheets. Some of them are topical. Some of them are uh, just large categories that you can look through. They're great lists. They're, there are tools everywhere. Part of technology today, we can lament technology, but technology is good. And the fact that I have an incredible app on my phone that, in fact, that those last three pages were all taken out of this app on my phone. It's called Fighter Verses, put together by Desiring God. It'll cost you three bucks, best three bucks you'll ever spend. You have all these verses on there, and it has all sorts of tricks on how to memorize them, and, and they're all put in there, and you can add your own verses and all sorts of stuff.
okay? If you're tech-savvy sort of stuff, okay? But I would like to propose this. If you could memorize one verse a month, You think that's doable? You think that's doable? One verse a month? After a year, you'd have how many? You'd have 12. You may think, well, that's not all that many. Oh, yes, it is. If you had 12 key verses memorized in one year, because yeah, then in, in two years, you'd have how many? 24. You would quickly see how it adds up. How long have you been Christians? Yeah, so if you, if you went back and it, like, like if you were encouraged to go back and do the math, you could say, hey, well, one verse a month, that's, that's not too bad. I can do that. All the songs and stuff that bounces around in that head. I mean, we could talk about memorization techniques and all of that. More than anything, I don't think we care that much about this. That's why I spent my whole time just charging us up. If the Son of God used the Word of God to defeat Satan, he didn't say, just get out of here. That's enough of that. He used the Word of God. How much more so you and I? Hmm. So let's, let's memorize it. Let's use it. Yeah. Jason, you know, I tried that. Now, I got through about two years or one month, maybe even close to three. And I need to tell you there's an issue that if you don't use them, don't say them and you don't look at them reasonably on a reasonable time. You forget them. You gotta re yeah. So you've gotta re up. You gotta, you gotta re up. You gotta you gotta keep you reviewing them because they fall out time. when you sleep. All right. There's a certain thing, there's gravity, and when you sleep, if you sleep on your side, don't sleep on your side. Stuff falls out. <laughs> you've got to use them. Okay. But does anyone in here have have grandchildren that might struggle with anxiousness? Could God use you? Instead of saying, it'll be all right, sweetheart. Instead, you said, you know the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. You know, he says in Philippians 4, cast all your anxiety upon him. He says that. And he will give you a, a peace that is greater than your circumstances. Okay? Good. Right? Give them life. Give them the word of God. It's the sword. There is a battle. Not only for your soul, for your children's soul. And for your grandchildren. There's a battle raging on all the time. But if you ain't fighting it right. And these are the weapons he's given us. Okay? So, we, we, can, we can share strategies. Look, if you put anything to music, you can memorize it easier. So, my wife has a whole bunch of CDs for the kids and singing songs and, and whatnot. It's great, right? Put it, put it to music. Um, you, can, you can use apps. Uh, you can do all sorts of things. You can get a buddy. You guys can call each other, your wife. Hey, let's memorize this verse. You can do it together. I get some of my counseling patients to, to get some of their loved ones. Memorize the same verses and let's use them together. You need this in warfare? Your dad loves you. He'll memorize it too. Let's go. Okay? Because it, it matters, right? And so do it together. Do it in community. <clears throat> well, let's just fight the fight that God's given us. And take it seriously. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a granddaughter that's very anxious. And she's 17 and uh, getting ready to go to college and all this. Thing. But I text her little scriptures. Amen. Just, just one verse. And so I texted her one day. I said, you know, I'm not going to send you any more texts because I'm sure it's bothering you. She goes, no, Grandma. I read them. I really read them. I love it. Um, yeah. So, Amen. Yeah. And it's there. And she does this. So I know that. Now, that I just I pray then that it just sinks into her soul that when something comes up during the day that she has the word of God that will come up and she'll be able to use it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Right? Amen. 
All right, that's all I got. I'm going to let you out early. I mean, I can give you other stuff, but this is where we are. Oh, yeah, you like that? I kept it short and sweet tonight. That's right. That's right. It doesn't matter if you want it to be a battleground or not. It is. It is. All right, so uh, a couple quick housekeeping things and we're done. Uh, we're going to be transitioning to prayer, all right? So your prayer life is going to be challenged and quickened, all right, as we move through spiritual disciplines. And then a teaser for the spring. I'm, I'm talking to Daniel, and we're going we're gonna to work on uh, continuing this idea of, of themes of the Scripture so that you can see, or, or threads of the Scripture, or what I called stories, uh, so that you can see uh, more of that, how to put your Bible together through the theme of worship or through the Exodus or some of those large patterns so that they just help. Uh, it's called biblical theology. It's the idea that you, you, there, are, there are a lot of themes in the Bible that, that start here and they're a story and you need to follow them all the way until the end. Okay, Like with the temple. You know the Garden of Eden is a temple? And then, and then it moves to uh, the tabernacle and then to, uh, to the, the temple and then to Jesus and then to us and then to the new heaven and the new earth. At, at the end, it's described as a temple. That's the whole thing. That's where it's all going. And why? Because that's where God is and that's where I want to be. We get to be with God. Amen. All right, so that's the picture. All right, all right. so some of those fun things, uh, I'll work on that to uh, be able to piece it together. I've got all these resources up here. Um, please, please, please ask me a hundred questions. Let me pray over you and we're done. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you have revealed yourself and that you have promises for us and that you intend for us to use it and that you've given us your Holy Spirit that reminds us of your word and quickens our spirit in the midst of the battle to be able to defeat our foe who wars for our mind Father, we want to think like you and we want to walk like you and talk like you and live out in victory. Uh, we do declare that we are dependent beings and that we are, are feeble and easily, easily confused. Uh, we need you and by your goodness, you have declared that you will be right by our side and walk us through and give us the victory. We trust you in that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. God bless you guys. <laughs>